Welcome to Winter Quarter's final Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders series live stream. We've teamed up with the Dean's Office at Stanford School of Engineering to create a special ETL session focused on Stanford's thought leadership in how ethics and principles can shape innovation. Today is the first in what we plan to be a series of events that will engage both School of Engineering alumni and Stanford students in vital conversations about the role of ethics in engineering and innovation across disciplines. I'm Jack Fuchs, adjunct lecturer at Stanford and director of principled entrepreneurship at STVP. If you're familiar with STVP, you know that we strive to equip every student with the tools to brave ethical complexity. We believe that if people and organizations have well-articulated principles, they will make better decisions. In my own teaching, we take students on a journey where they develop their own values and principles they will bring with them in their careers. They will then help instill those principles in their organizations, helping better navigate difficult decisions. For today's session, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Russ Altman and Dr. Kim Branson for a conversation about the ethical issues at play at the intersection of artificial intelligence and drug discovery. Russ is the Kenneth Fong Professor of Bioengineering, Genetics, Medicine, Biomedical Data Science, and Computer Science at Stanford, and is a past chair of Stanford's Bioengineering Department. His primary research interests are in the application of computing to problems relevant to medicine. He also holds a Sirius XM radio show and podcast entitled The Future of Everything. We will put a link to this podcast in the chat. Kim is a senior vice president and global head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. He leads the GSK.ai team, a global organization of nearly 100 machine learning researchers and engineers who are pioneering the application of AI to drug discovery and development. And since Russ and Kim know each other in part through their joint development of the GSK AI slash Stanford Ethics Fellowship, which we'll focus on later in the conversation. But first, Russ and Kim, let's begin looking at how issues of ethics and principles first emerged in your careers. Russ, can you begin by sharing some thoughts on how you developed the values and principles that define your work in bioengineering? Yeah, yes. And uh, thanks very much, Jack, for having us. I'm um, really looking forward to this. Um, so, um, you you listed all the, those all of those departmental affiliations, and the one I want to start out with because it really was my first was the Department of Medicine. So I grew up uh, at this at the School of Medicine, and I did my residency there, and I was hired on the faculty in the Department of Medicine. And of course, I think no one is surprised that bioethics or biomedical ethics has always been a thing. Uh, certainly. Uh, for most of the 20th century, as it became clear that it was important to put some guardrails in place because doctors previously had been doing some very questionable things and really entire societies with some of the Nazi experiments that came out uh, and some, and the Tuskegee incident in which uh, African-Americans were ill-treated by, by the system, by the U.S. government. Um, the, the, this has always been present in medicine. So it was a, a part and parcel of my training. Um, Usually, however, focused on kind of two obvious settings. The first setting would be the individual patient and the ethics of making decisions as a physician or a clinician or a provider for a patient who's sitting in front of you, who's depending on you for assistance and needs you to behave ethically. And then, of course, the second setting would be clinical trials, which need to be always designed to be ethical. And that, for example, means you can't have a placebo arm uh, versus a potential treatment if there's already a treatment available. That would be unethical to have a half of your patients not even receive standard of care. So just that one example kind of shows you that we had to learn how to think through uh, even the very process of gathering basic medical knowledge and certainly its application to patients. So if I may, um, I think it will be useful for our conversation to just quickly remind people, many, many people might know this, um, about one of the most um, useful frameworks 
for ethical reasoning. And, I, and let me acknowledge that there are many frameworks and Kant had a framework, uh, Kantian deontological reasoning, consequentialism and utilitarianism. But the one that has had the most um, uh, purchase in medicine is, is based on something called the Belmont Report. And there, there are four principles that we always use in biomedical ethics. So the first principle is beneficence. You should be do, doing an endeavor to do good for the patient. Um, and, and, it, the, uh, and, and that's very important. So you can't be doing something that's um, null for the patient. It has to be in, in support. Um, or that, I'm talking about the patient, but that's in any situation, you should be trying to do good. So that's beneficence. Non-maleficence means you should not be doing harm. Uh, you should not be intentionally. Now, bad things can happen in the course of research and in the course of clinical care, but you are trying to not have bad things happen. And that's non-maleficence. And so when you're evaluating a situation, you'll say, am I trying to do good? Am I avoiding doing bad? Then the two other ones, and these are a little bit more Kantian. Those first two are a little bit more utilitarian for those of you who who know about that, but it's not important. Justice is number three. Justice is basically, is it fair? Are these rules that can be applied impartially across an entire population and everyone is getting a fair shake? So you look for injustice because that's a sign potentially of an unethical treatment or an unethical clinical trial. And finally, autonomy. Is whatever is happening being done in such a way that the person being affected, the clinical trial subject or the patient, has um, autonomy, I shouldn't use that word, has control of their own fate? Anytime you're taking away control of someone's fate or taking control away from them entirely, that's a red flag for ethics. So whenever we get a situation, we look at beneficence, non-maleficence, justice and autonomy. That's what the Belmont Report taught us. And I think it's a very good framework that, to be honest, I even use in other settings, uh, like my everyday life and, and certainly in engineering, which maybe we'll talk about later. Thank you, Russ. Um, and uh, uh, turning to Kim, could you share with us some of the values and principles you've brought with you to your work with AI and ML and drug discovery and perhaps how they fit into the values and principles of GSK as an organization? Sure. I mean, like Russ, I also, you know, um, wandered past a med school, um, but most of my training has been in science. And interestingly, in, in science, you don't often have a lot of the same sort of exposure of ethics uh, that we do in medicine. And there, and maybe that's something we need to sort of revisit. Um, I worked in building sort of predictive systems in medicine and, and healthcare for a long time. And one of the things that is a core principle I've always had is that we have data and these sorts of things gives us tremendous potential to make things better. But you have to look very carefully at the system you're putting in place and its unintended consequences and the feedback loops you can have. So coming to GSK and establishing the AI group, and our GSK is a 300-year-old company, right? It's been around for a long time. It's an extremely trusted brand. We know how to make medicines. You know, when you see that little logo on the box, it's going to be safe, efficacious, you know, and it's a really great thing. When you're starting, now we're building this new AI group, we're going to start using data and building new things. We need to make sure that we, we build medicines for all people. We want to make sure algorithms and the algorithmic products that we're building also affect all people in the same way. So it's very important for us to have those sort of same types of principles and think about them. And so we are now in a, a, in a world where a lot of the way we discover and develop medicines is now data driven. And it's all machine learning, it's all feedback loops. So we realize that anything we build, anything we put in place gets used, people start to base decisions upon it and, and use that again can lead to a feedback loop. So for us, we, are, we want to be very careful to understand what that is and to think through the consequence of that. And really, it, for us, it's a choice of what problems we do work on and, and, and what we don't work on, right, is an ethical decision. But a key thing also to this is that we can't decide not to do something because we can't make it like, you know, it's, it's also unethical not to solve a problem for someone if you can't solve it for everybody, right? So how do you wrestle with these types of things? And I think that's, that, and that's something that there are, we know there are biases in literature, you know, who's represented various genetic databases and things like that, you know? It, and so all those types of questions, they actually come into play in a very realistic fashion as we start to think through what we do. So we have an idea of building software for each one of our assets, right? To help how to use it uh, in, in a setting. 
Now, the best way we generate data for that is in clinical trials. However, the people that come into clinical trials, there are many biases to who can participate in a clinical trial or not. So how do you actually, what efforts do you go to expand that access? And those, there are many questions on that. So all those types of things, something, when you start to think about this, you suddenly realize that you need an ethical framework for thinking through these things. Now, GSK as a company has amazing ethical frameworks for lots of other types of areas, but this is a new thing. Right. When, and so this is where this has really led to actually like the idea of chatting with Russ about like we need a sense of um, practical engineering ethics for these types of things. These aren't abstract things that we're going to think about great goose scenarios and what ifs. These are real things that are happening now that we actually have to make decisions about. That's uh, delightful to hear, Kim, because we teach students that companies should develop a broad set of, of principles that, uh, that, that need to be commit, that need to be communicated that need to be instilled in an organization and that will come into conflict as you just described. Um, and it's the wrestling with those principles within the context of a decision that provides the power in, in decision-making. Um, you just described one very one, one in particular, and I'm gonna try to use that as an example. Um, uh, Kim or Russ, actually, then you can also uh, respond. Do you have any recommendations from your experience at GSK of how best to incorporate those principles into the decision making at the organization or examples where GSK has wrestled with, you know, maybe even specifically that value, that, that, that those principles of, hey, if we can't solve it for everyone, we shouldn't solve it for anyone. Well, that's clearly not right, right? Um, right. It's unethical, as you say, to solve something, to not solve something for some if you can. But like, where do you draw the line, and and how um, you know where is the bias, and how is the bias, and 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 uh, where do you go from there? So I guess the you know that those kinds of questions to you about whether there's tips for people about how to instill this throughout the organization, or examples and situations of how you've had to wrestle with it, and then Russ, you can as well uh, comment on that. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things we have is sort of a checklist when we're starting to consider to build a product. So us as an organization, we only try and do large impactful things, right? We're not solving someone, I want to transform this Word document to an Excel spreadsheet and building a thing for that. We're building big things to impact patients or help discover targets and things like that. And they have large-term, long-term commitments in the company. We discover a target, we do something, we're committing money to it. There's an opportunity cost. There's all these things that happen to that. So these are big problems we're working on. So the first thing we look at is, well, first of all, let's look at the data you're using, right? And you can't sit there and say, well, this is the data I've got, this is the data I can find. The qu first question is, if, is, is your data adequately representative, right? Is it got biases and if not? And, you know, have, is, are there other sources where you could find more data, right? And that's a very interesting question. And then you ask like, if, well, it's, sometimes it's not okay to say, I, can't, I just couldn't find it, it's not out there. You say, well, should we gather it, right? Should we just go and actively gather the data? And that's actually pretty new to most people that come into machine learning, particularly at school. They're like, what do you mean? Like, like, well, we'll just buy more, we'll generate more. We can maybe run a study. How do we do this? And we can look at the cost of doing that, right? Now, if it's obviously there are a lot, it, you know, there are time bounds and large amounts of money to do this sort of stuff that maybe it's infeasible or sorts of things, depending on what you want to do, but you have to make an attempt and we have to have understood that. And we pre-specify what biases we know about that. And we made reasonable attempts to address all of them. And I think that that's before you even write a single line of code, right? Just to think through what that is. And then you think the other thing you think about is, is the what if scenario. I have the model, it's in production, so what? What, what do people do with it? What's, what's my intended use, right? And you can write that, well, that's easy. That's what I want to build the model for. And then what are my unintended uses? If someone else had access to this or what would use this, how else could they use this in different settings? And that's where, you know, I worked on systems in the past that could predict people's probably of getting disease in, at time T given their past medical history really good for planning care, really good for doing preactive implementations, things like that, all great stuff. Also really good for actuarial methods for insurance companies and pricing healthcare and things like that. Possibly good stuff, maybe less good stuff, depending on the regulatory environment. So you have to also think of the intended and unintended uses that you can when you put something into production and how it changes the world around them. Those are our two anchoring principles, what goes into the machine milling thing and what comes out of it from the other side. And we have, we have checklists and things that help people think through that Right, and a lot. It's about thinking through that, and to make sure. Okay, this is. Tell us what your original intent with your model is. What you, how you want to make the world a better place, and then let's work out the best way that we can practically do to accept that aim. And also, how do we monitor 
That's the third thing. How do we monitor this doing that in practice, right? So you can't just build these things and like off it goes and I'll go and work another problem. Someone has to someone has to watch it and log its results and review it. And that's something that also is kind of new that you don't get during grad school and other types of industries as well. Uh, I'll leave Rick Russ to <laughs> chime in there. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think of, um, you know, I'm an academic, I'm a professor, and I think of our role as upstream of, of what, you know, we're sending our folks into Kim's environment and to other environments. So when you think about that, there's a couple of things that we have to do. First, we have to have some formal training in ethics for engineers. And so I'll just briefly tell you the story of the bioengineering undergraduate major is pretty new, and it was actually kicked off when I was chair. And we there's a process, I'm happy to report, that Stanford has a pretty serious process for vetting new majors where you get comments from your colleagues who are outside of the department. And by far, the and this was in the uh, late early you know 2000 to 2010 time frame so more than 10 years ago by far the most common and strongest piece of advice we got from every committee that looked at this major was you must train these students in ethics and their their logic was pretty straight line and short it was you are giving them unbelievable power tools and this was this was even before CRISPR kind of came out, where now we can literally. But they they knew they knew that where bioengineering was going, and they said you're giving amazing power tools to these folks. They have to have a compass for navigating this. And so, um, as a side a story, um, I drew the straw. It wasn't short. I'm happy to have drawn the straw for um, for teaching. And so I for the last 10 plus years with David Magnus, a colleague uh, in the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, we've been teaching a class on um, uh, bioengineering ethics. It's different from medical ethics because it's more upstream in terms of technology development and whatnot. So, and, and as many people know, um, our colleagues in computer science have kicked off a class in ethics. The Stanford's current strategic plan has ethics all over it, and I think appropriately. And so we we knew this was coming. And so all of our undergraduates, at least, get a pretty good exposure for a whole quarter on these issues, and they write about it. Um, I should say that we have 30 or 40 undergraduates each year, and we're getting 200 people in that class. So there's a lot of people who are not bioengineers who are taking that class. And I'd be happy to talk about it more, but that was the, the, the first thing that we need to do for Kim, basically. We, we need to send Kim employees who have this vocabulary. Um, on that same theme, though, we, uh, we have to practice it in our labs. We, I think PIs who host graduate students and undergraduates and postdocs, we have to model this ethical behavior. And, and Kim said it earlier, why are we working on problem X and not problem Y? I mean, a bad answer would be there's more money in X than there is in Y. A good answer would be X is a more pressing societal problem or is part of a very complex and a little bit of progress in X would um, make the world a better place in, in very real ways. So, and this, let, let me be very honest, this has not been a routine way that me and my colleagues choose research projects. I'm not saying that we're um, mercenaries, but I don't think people have always been intentional about the ethical framework about and their choice of research projects, but I'm beginning to see it and I'm excited about it because I think that will also model for the students and the trainees that before they go out into their you know various exciting careers that this stuff needs to be embedded in your everyday decision making. It's not just something, uh, this is a famous saying, you don't just sprinkle ethics on top of a project. The, just like a plane starts with the wing, the fuselage, a project has to start with the scientific question and the ethical framework of that question. It doesn't have to be you know, a tome, but it has to be one of the dimensions. And so those are the two ways that we're trying to set people up so that when GSK hires them, uh, they're pretty clueful about all this. Work in progress, not claiming that we're done. Well, and also leads to a, a question, Kim, a kind of a practical question. Uh, you know, Russ described, well, you know, the, the, a bad answer would be we work on this because there's a lot of money to be made. You know, a, a good answer is we do it because it's solving a societal, a, a, an important societal problem. I'm paraphrasing. Um, you know, Kim, it, it, I mean, is there a penalty for having good ethics? Uh, if, you, if you as a company, if GSK 
um, uh, follows that advice? Do they then wind up underperforming relative to competition? And um, you know, how do you, how do you how does GSK think about that? And how do you think about that? I mean, for us, it 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 comes down to really longevity and trust, right? Like, you, you know, you need to think we, this, as I said before, 300 years of history, you want to continue on, right? Do you want to be the guy who breaks the chain and ruins that 300 year brand? I don't think you do. And there's a reason for that. You have to think very carefully about it. And I think there's, there's some things you can, you don't have to pick up every dollar that's out there. And there are some things that are, are, are the correct things to work on. And we kind of fundamentally believe that ethical science, right, is better science. And the reason why it's better science is those types of questions force you to engage more. Well, this is the data I've got. Forces you to engage more, forces you to understand how to collect the data, why there are structures to get the data. It helps you be involved in the patient's lives. It helps you understand the systems that have that data in a real practical sense, which means you probably build a better solution, right? A better solution, right, we fundamentally will, will win out in the market it's probably more robust as well from a machine learning perspective that so it, and it can be used more. So it is a, it is fundamentally it comes down to trust, right? Making an attempt to build the, the best thing you can for everybody. And in, by, in the process of doing that, you engage more people. You make that you also make get a flywheel effect, right? You're solving problems, maybe understanding why people don't come into trial. Maybe you can fix something to get the data that now we have more people in trials and we, and we actually can come up with, better medicines, right? More representation. So there is a flywheel effect of doing that properly. Um, for us, it's not, as Russell talking about sprinkling ethics about it, it's not about having the ethics police, right? So too often you see people trying to bring ethicists in on top of the team as a regulatory thing or something else coming after the fact or things like that. You can't do it like it has to be done at the same time, right? So you have to think very carefully about the ethical culture you create with your machine learning people. And that's something where we're very um, keen, to, keen to have, right, is the right kind of people. This, so this is why we have uh, responsible AI people and a VP of uh, ethics and policy around these things because policy and ethics are actually kind of intertwined, right? That's why we have regulators, right? What are the regulators doing, right? They're actually enforcing a lot of the principles that Russ actually stated earlier, right? That's why we have regulators in society and things like that. So there is a, there's a constant dialogue between that and I think so. That this is so that's something we've thought very carefully about, uh, and so we have there as they're fully fledged part of the team, but they're also technical people as well, and that's a very key thing. I think that's part of that two cultures thing is something we're trying to sort of change with that this, this new fellowship. Um, and uh, let's uh, ask this question to Russ first, and then to Kim. But Kim just mentioned something that uh, that one of the the attendees has a question uh, in, in the chat um, for perspective. For prospective founders looking to build in the intersection of ML slash AI and health, do you think governmental regulators and interventions are a reason to worry about progress happening too slowly? And is that a big enough deterrent not to get into the area? And uh, that's the specific question, but let's generalize a bit to your to the role and the interaction between and among regulators and industry and, and how that... Um, uh, how that how that plays out, how you think that plays out. Um, and we'll go to Russ first because, uh, Kim, you just answered, but I definitely want to go to you afterwards because it touches on what you just described. Yeah, yeah, that is a great question uh, because it's so it seems so obvious that um, that regul and, and, and that regulation would could could only be a, a thing that slows things down and uh, kind of um, uh, torpedoes some of your best efforts. But and, and let me say that I've had uh, conversations with um, CEOs of extremely famous, extremely large tech companies in um, the Silicon Valley who will say. We will not engage. Now, this is old. This is old information. This is this was ten years ago. But ten years ago, they would uniformly say to me, "We will not engage in a project within our company if we see the FDA anywhere near it." Uh, and I just want to say that the the world has changed and the FDA has changed. So, first, two sentences on my credentials on this: I am the co-PI of an FDA-funded Center of Excellence on Regulatory Science, where we 
have collaborations between FDA scientists and UCSF and Stanford scientists in areas that are critical for the FDA to understand. And you will not be surprised to learn that digital health and AI is one of the areas that they come to us a lot. There are several of these centers around the company, but uh, around the country, but you will not be surprised to learn that we're the one who gets a lot of the interest for AI and ML in health. Uh, and we've had several projects with them. Um, the FDA scientists are extremely interested and caring about bringing these technologies to patients. That's their entire, their entire professional is to protect the health of the American public while allowing drugs, diagnostics, and that includes, and therapeutics, including AI therapeutics, and many of you will know this, some have been approved. And so um, it seems scary, but I have seen over and over again that even for a startup, there is a very well understood way to have a pre-submission meeting with the FDA where you describe the technology that you're developing. You describe everything you can about it. It's kind of a confidential meeting. So th this is not on the public record. And then they give you an assessment of what their questions would likely be. Uh, they do that at the meeting, but they also go back, think and talk, and then send you a letter with the, these concerns so that you don't have too much of a moving target where now, they can't guarantee because things happen, but they they give a best effort of what you would need to do to demonstrate the safety or efficacy of, of this, whatever this tool is. Uh, and I've talked to startup people and it starts out scary. They usually wait too long for that meeting because it, it kind of reminds me of a PhD student who doesn't want to do their defense because everything is not finished or even their quals. Um, and I tell them, just get in front of your committee and tell them where you are. It will be useful. And it's the same thing for founders. They're so worried about the FDA uh, interaction that they actually delay it too long. You're allowed to have more than one of these meetings. You don't have to have all the answers at the first meeting. And it's extremely unlikely that you say something that torpedoes your entire effort because the FDA is not out to torpedo your effort. But they're out to set expectations. So that, I, I hope that wasn't too long, but I, I'm actually bullish that the FDA is learning how to spell AI, understands there's a tsunami of things coming uh, to them, and is staffing up or else getting collaborative help like from, from our center to make sure that they can you know, obey all the laws about the response times for um, various submissions. So, so I, I wouldn't be afraid of the FDA. And in fact, I would engage with them ASAP so that you can see that they're just real scientists who are just trying to protect the public and help you get your product your products out the door. And I'd be interested to hear what, what Kim's experience. That's usually for startups. Uh, I wonder if GSK has the same experience as a 300-year-old big drug company. Oh, yeah. and, and Kim also uh, broadened to how GSK thinks about that, uh, that, that regulators and GSK each involved in this emerging set of set of principles. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had experience from the startup side and also from the company side. And I think the first thing I learned from startup stuff is, yeah, we wait too long. But turns out the regulators are people too. And a lot of them are really passionate scientists. And I think that's it's really important to understand, like, okay, we actually have regulation in lots of industries. There's regulation running a food truck. You know, there's regulation in if you want to sell your product, this is the people you have to talk to. But actually engage them early on and having a dialogue. And they're quite open to understanding how to do things. A lot of it is they're seeking to understand and they'll tell you why, why this particular regulation, why they think like this. And you can have a dialogue, whether that's a case or not. And, and, it, and it's actually one of those things you're sort of not taught. You kind of have this thing, the FDA is like the IRS. It's only a bad thing, right? Very different department, right? They're there for, they're there for a very different reason. And you can engage them. And I think the other thing is that um, I think people, what people fail to understand is that regulatory regu environment is a constant dialogue between industry, right, and the regulator. So, you know, from the GSK perspective, we could have conversations with them. I'm like, we're helping develop, like, what is good machine learning practice, right, for building medicines, right? Should the same thing of how we do update softwares for a pacemaker be the same thing for updating software that I'm trying to do a diagnostic, you know, for a computational pathology algorithm, right? And actually, how even should the regulator validate work, right? So previously in drug discovery, run a clinical trial, I get all my primary data, we do some statistical analysis, 
We give the FDA, they check our homework, say we get the same conclusion, there's a debate. I'm glossing over this in horrible terms and Russell's <laughs> smiling. But that's kind of the process, right? And off they go. But for machine learning algorithm, why doesn't the regulator have their own independent set of data that I don't have, right? It's an API. Why don't they decide they're going to call at any time? Why don't they, they can continuously monitor something in production if they wanted to, right? We do have monitoring in production right now in the pharmaceutical industry is adverse drug reports, right? There is a parallel for these types of things, right? So what you have to do is have a conversation with the regulator. You need to talk to them about this sort of stuff saying, hey, we think this is how you could do it, right? And also explain to them the types of people they need to be hiring or training, right? You know, they need software engineers, right? They've got really great statisticians at the FDA and people like that because they've needed to have them to understand new trial design. So it's an evolving concept. And I would say the more you engage with them and told them what you want to do and how to do something, right? you know, you get to know people there, right? And you can actually, as a small 20 person company or a giant pharmaceutical company, have these conversations with them as well, right? They'll, they, and I think that's a really important thing is to engage in that dialogue. And the regulatory environments are there for a reason. Now, it may not evolve in law as fast as you want, right? Um, but this is where I think that typically there is always a path to work with them to do, to do something, right? Because as, as Russell, they are highly motivated, right, to try and change healthcare, right? Because the other thing is if they, if they just say no to everything, right, and I know Russ probably remembers the sale, of, there was a famous regulator who said no to everything that never allowed a single drug in in their entire career. But that's that also that doesn't work right and that leads to a backlash against that sort of thing right and then and then once that happens we lose we end up having building things out as safe right so there is that interplay so i think it's very important to engage involve and realize it's an evolving thing and you can push on it if the laws aren't static right you can campaign for change and and, and give really strong reasoning for doing that and it's an educational type component as well and you'll learn from them right Thank, thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, and Kim, another question from the audience. Uh, Kim said, we only do big things. Uh, address the ROI of not looking at rare diseases when a corporation doesn't see enough market share or market size is probably what they mean for a big return or even a return. Um, I, and let me make it a little bit harder. Um, you know, it's, this is one of those wrestling with uh, the financial return versus solving a, 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 an important societal problem. Um, sometimes the answer to that is to charge a, an, an insane amount for the drug in order to make the, the market size big enough. So um, how do you wrestle with that um, at GSK? Yeah, when I was saying that we don't do big things, I was talking about like the objectives of the AI department. We do only work on a few things that we think are very impactful, right? Have thousand X impact within GSK. But if you come down to um, the landscape, um, so in many ways, the cost to run a trial and things like that can only get so cheap, right? No matter what you do, whether you're doing it for one patient or without, you know, things like that, there aren't, there's just a sitting, right? So those are some, just the economic realities of running trials at multiple centers and all the sort of overhead that goes with things. So in order to offset that, there are various types of incentives, right? And tax structures, orphan drug acts, things like that, rare disease acts. And what you actually have is a set of companies that have built, um, built therapeutics for those rare diseases, those single Mendelian genetic disorders and things like that. And so, and they are typically smaller companies, right? So they have lower overhead. Um, maybe they've done a, they have a longer research phase and then they then they sort of maybe shut that down and go to production to conserve their capital and do that sort of thing. But that's the way we've typically um, seen those sorts of things being addressed. Now, there's a lot of those companies and, and in many ways, a lot of those easy to easy to build a medicine, rare diseases are getting done. And you're seeing some interesting things, right? There are, you know, there are, and it's not that they're always done by small companies. Sometimes they're done by very, very big companies as well. Right, but the way they get around that is through the various sort of incentive structures for patent life cycle and pricing and things like that, right? And expedited review. Um, the standards are sometimes that we apply to that for a rare disease, but say maybe you're giving a medicine to a small population for which there is nothing else, right? And maybe it's 50 or 100 patients, different ethical risk, risk reward, risk harm ratios are used compared to. I'm going to give this statin to most people aged over 50 and they're going to take it for 20 years, right? Very, very different risk reward approach. We'll be very careful about that. That all comes to regular sort of stuff. So it's not something that like, you know, oh, we only do things if we can make a billion dollars out of it, right? And I think the other thing to remember is, to be honest, the age of the billion dollar blockbuster drugs is going away, right? There are very few of those 
left to find anymore where it's the one medicine that works amazingly well in all comers, right? There's always competition in these different types of things as well. So what it actually is now is the way of finding cheaply and effectively the patients for which your drug is 15 times X more effective than, than, in another, than in another population. So differentiation now is the name of the game, right? And that's the trend, right? Rare diseases are really nice because they're a very well differentiated population because they are rare and you know who has them perhaps, right? It's, it's the discovery thing. So there's a lot of things that go into play with that decision. Great. Um, and uh, shifting gears a little bit to Russ, because I want to make sure, and, and we'll also ask him this question too. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled with this uh, with the partnership that you two have been working on. Uh, and staff, Stanford faculty is on the forefront of ethical thought leadership applied to technology and often in collaboration with industry. Um, and this uh, GSK.AI Stanford Ethics Fellowship is a case study. And I mentioned it briefly at the outset. Um, it's a new postdoctoral fellowship that allows researchers to study ethical considerations at the intersection of AI and machine learning and drug discovery. So first, Russ, could you briefly touch on what led to this kind of postdoctoral fellowship and how it was designed? Yes. So um, I don't know if this came up in the introductions, but uh, but Kim, uh, as a youth, spent time at Stanford, uh, uh, and so I I know Kim, and we 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 meet every now and then, and we talk about stuff. And so I'm going to have to give a lot of credit to Kim because um, I had my jaw drop one day when a representative of a major pharmaceutical company, who I also knew when he was a postdoc, uh, came up to me and really said. Um, I don't want to say drop it in my lap, but he said, we have a pretty clear idea, Russ. He, he made the arguments that you heard earlier about why this was absolutely critical to GSK. He knew that we, we had some um, presence in bioethics and biomedical ethics at the medical school and at the engineering school, which is very important because this is a, you know, this is a bridging kind of issue because of the AI as well as the medicine being involved. And so really, Kim's challenge to the Stanford faculty was, how could this work? And how fast can we get it up and running? Because, you know, I work for a big company, Russ, and we don't have the same timescales that you sometimes have. I need it yesterday. And so we, we right away started talking about how it could run. Fortunately, uh, the Stanford Center of Biomedical Ethics has a long history of training fellows, uh, it, especially fellows with technical backgrounds. So that fell into place very nicely. Um, we kind of wrote down some of the scenarios that somebody might research. We worked out all the intellectual property to make sure that, uh, you know, very importantly, this has to not look like we're shills for JSK and there has to be kind of academic independence. And yet GSK is paying for the, a lot of the training. And so we have to make sure that the outputs are of, of at least of relevance and of interest. So working through those conversations was uh, fun and challenging, but not killer. Uh, and then we announced this program and we're actually recruiting for it actively. Um, they will have full academic freedom to focus in the area. I think the, let me just say that the big new idea here is ethics in clinical trials for drug development is well established. But what Kim said to us that really got us excited is we want to focus on the very early stage discovery. When you're doing genome-wide association with people's genomes, when you're looking at cellular data about how diseases... So this is very early when it's not about patients. It's more about those issues I was discussing before, the choice of problem, the choice of whose cell line are we going to discover um, make discoveries on, which population uh, genome sequences. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let um, Kim chime in on this, but that was the genesis of the project. And now we're, we're going to have people come, usually post PhD, spend a couple of years with faculty mentorship and kind of a collaboration with relevant GSK, GSK scientists, and then try to make traction on some of these tough problems. Great. And Kim, how did you navigate the waters of GSK to, to make this happen? I, I think it is. I think Russ's description is, is, is fairly accurate. I think one of the things we realized and then coming back to the way we're discovering drugs now is it's a lot more data driven, right? So it is genome wide association studies. It is, and that gives you a hint of which genes you do. You might do functional genomics now, right? So this is CRISPR and other technologies. We have induced pluripotent stem cell lines, right? Which donors are we taking those from, right? You know, is it just one line or a panel of donors, right? 
And all those things, when you put together, right, think of, you know, I've done the GWAS in this population. If a minority group isn't represented there, right, and maybe their gene, there's a different risk allele for that, we don't discover it. And you realize something when you chain all these things together, they have a reinforcing effect. And those are the things that come out the other end as a target where we have prosecuting, making medicine, do it running to a trial. And you realize all these things individually, like, oh, well, I'm not using stuff for clinical with a clinical patient, so it doesn't, it doesn't apply. But actually, when you, you step up a layer and look at this as a systems level type approach, you realize like, oh, yes, it really matters what goes into the machine where and how we use the data and how we make the decisions at each gate as things flow through. Um, and it was also driven by, you, you know, you when you have a conversation to an angle, like, oh, we're going to have, we have a code of ethics. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, sure, I read it. Good tick, Kim. I'm like, no, no, it means something. Like, like it's not just, you know, you have to tick a thing compliance, right? Because we, we we're we used to dealing with regulated patient data and things like that. The problem that we observed is that a lot of the people in ethics literature are not technical and not computational. So typically the way they've addressed problems or talked about things are either so remote that it was like, I don't know what to do with that, like an AGI type problem, or just like, you know, just not relevant, right? Not practical. They're like, okay, that I see that. What, what should I do? Help me. So the idea was like, well, actually what we need to do is we really need to do research in ethics, right? So we have things right now. And like, there are whole things like, for instance, there's a concept of what we call, I call a data cold chain. So a cold chain is something I have so I can move, which we all know about like, you know, vaccines across the country and I can do things, keep them refrigerated and safe. So I built a really great algorithm that does computational pathology and it can predict various outcomes and things like that. If you're in a country that doesn't have the data infrastructure to do that, you can't benefit from it, right? So what does that mean? Do, should we be investing in the data cold chain for those companies? Should we be advising sort of stuff, or should we just say, "Well, you don't have it, but you know it works great if you're living in a if you're living in North America, right, or the UK, or something like that?" And suddenly you realize that there is a, there are a lot of issues around this sort of thing, but there's also research about how these things are used. And like because we don't know, these are all new. We need to actually start doing the research now. And rather than than like just doing it and then saying, "Oh, that was bad," now we write some policies about it. Like actually, let's get ahead of the game and try to do that. So let's. So the idea is like learn from the previous approach that's happened in medicine, right? As Russ said, all those sort of things that happened previously, we can start doing research about that. What are the implications? So that's the idea of like, let's create a fellowship that also has people that are that are technically trained, right? That will learn these types of things. So that really, and to be honest, I would say a fraction of the AI community does simply ignore a lot of the ethic type stuff, right? Like it's not as it's not as bad as it used to be. It's definitely changing. People are realizing that. But for a long time, they're like, they just kind of ignored it, right? It was like, no, I've got steady art. I've done this sort of thing, right? I'm focusing on my facial recognition task. It's really awesome. My, my model's 10% better than, than this other guy's. Look at my new architecture. Like, yeah, it's a cool problem that you're focusing on, but it lives in a wider context. Have you thought about that? And now people are thinking like, oh yeah, that's probably a thing, right? So we want to do the same thing now, right? In our particular niche, right? And it's I, we think it's fundamentally going to be about research driven to lead practical solutions, right? Very good. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'm trying to do as many of the audience questions as possible. I still have a few that we'll probably get to, but uh, on on the other side, but. Uh, th from the audience, there's always a lot of hype in the media about the use of AI in drug discovery and development. What's the true state of the situation? What are the areas where AI and ML does, does and does not work is the, the way they form it? Or, or let's say, where is it more promising? Where is it potentially overhyped? I'll, I'll start out. This is what Kim does for a living, so that I definitely don't want to follow him <laughs> on, on this question. But but um, but I do. I, I think about this, and I do. I do some kind of consulting, and I've seen some. So here's what, what I see. First of all, for the very very large genomic data sets, AI is pretty much mandatory to pull out the signals of which genetic variants, especially in combination, are correlating with the, the phenotypes, that is to say the diseases of interest. So that some of the, the big data is almost big enough to impress the folks who really deal with really big data. You know, the, the Google, Facebook, Twitter people are in a stratosphere. We are below that, but it's pretty respectable big data at the genome. So that's the first thing. Second of all, everybody knows that AI is good at detecting patterns. And this can be very useful when looking like looking at electronic medical records for finding a bunch of patients 
whose disease looks similar. A lot of diseases are really waste waste bins of like <clears throat> all different kinds of people with slightly different diseases. And when you do a clinical trial, of course, your drug is only going to work on 20% of the people because 20% of them actually have a version of the disease where that drug is relevant. And any 80% might not even have the disease or they just have a totally different form. The AI systems are very good at finding patients who are kind of looking very similar along all available dimensions, and that's also very valuable. Now, jumping very molecular, uh, you've, we've all heard about AlphaFold2. AlphaFold2 is the program out of DeepMind that was able to predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins. I'll just remind people who haven't taken biology since high school that those three-dimensional proteins are typically what we call the targets of a drug. A drug is often a small molecule that binds one of these proteins and modulates its function to help the patient have, a, you know, have their disease go away or get better. So going from just some protein three-dimensional structures to all of the structures at a, at least almost all at a reasonable level of accuracy opens up our ability to think about in a very rational way, new drugs to interact with proteins that we weren't able to, to, to think about previously because we didn't have the structure. And, uh, and so that whole three-dimensional structure and molecular understanding of drug action is about to be revolutionized. I, I mean, it's happening right now. Um, I can't tell you how quickly engineering students read those papers walked into my office and said, I want to work on the spin out effects of that discovery. It took about a month for them to figure out. And so, so I, I'm sure Kim has other examples, but, but right now, um, those are the areas where I'm seeing a lot of excitement and a lot of uh, positive results, even impacting successful drug launches. Yeah. I, I think drug discovery and development is a big big uh, set of fields, right? They intersect there. So there are, as Russ said, there's a lot of things that are happening in, you know, the early discovery phase. So certainly, you know, yes, GWAS. Now, GWAS itself is a pretty old technique, right? Multiple sequential independent hypothesis. You better testing. define GWAS. Oh, genetic-wide association studies, right? So you think like, what? That's still how we do things? Except we now are building that, we're now building models that look on raw DNA sequence and predict open and closed chromatin. And these are stacked encoder models, right? For doing these sorts of things that explain how things can change across different cell types. Um, we frequently do these very large functional genomic screens where we I can do every single gene up and down by the pairwise type stuff or these various poor CRISPR things. So these methods like PerturbSeq, they generate very large data points. Um, like I think last year we probably generated, I don't know, 25 billion data points for as a feedback loop for a single ML model we're building. So that's something we actually generate data just to feed into our algorithm. So the algorithm becomes a discovery tool. So that probably gives you an indication of how important it is. Um, there's been amazing advances, obviously, you know, in computer vision. Well, that now applies to what we're doing with cells, cellular phenotypes. I can track things over time. Adding time to everything is key for biology, right? Because these are dynamical systems that change. I can now do single cell RNA seq. So I can take a single cell and I can do genome sequencing and RNA sequencing of that, right? And I can do that over time. I can look at cellular morphologies. I can look at protein expression as well, um, functional characterization. So now we have all this multimodal data, right? It's really difficult to integrate. So one of the great methods, and particularly around neural networks, this sort of stuff is transfer learning and, and multi multimodal integration. Um, so that's the, all these things come into about not so much like I'm talking mostly about. What is the target? What is the thing you should make the medicine about, right? So even in doing that, we have an AI system that we use for even, uh, here's, a, here's where I want to drive my cellular model to, my clinical translation model to, right? What is the best target for doing that? Now, I could just do one gene at a time, 20,000 things, and I'm using CRISPR to modulate it rather than making a small molecule tool. That's something super new. Or I can actually be a bit more smart and I can turn everything into a sequential learning problem take some data, generate some data, have a multimodal feedback where I want to try and make the thing look like this thing, express the same genes, and it maybe make this protein at a higher level, right? That's going to be a really good drug target. That helps them discover something. And then from that, then it's the, it's the design, right? So it could be a small molecule like Russ is talking, but it could equally well could be an antibody, right? And now we use, you know, Gaussian processes and all sorts of Bayesian optimization to optimize the antibody sequence, right? For various properties, not only just binding, but aggregation, lyophilization, stability, because it has to last for a long time, right? So it starts to feed into the manufacturer aspects. It goes into the recruitment aspects as well. 
And so we see, you know, you have this lab in the loop of all your models, but we also have the clinic in the loop, right? So Russ's earlier point, a lot of diseases are sort of, you know, made up by Victorian men in top hats, right? They're all symptomology, right? But when you, but now we can measure things on such a fine scale so we can get a population of people who have a disease and observe them and start to characterize things, what's going on. Like, let's be a Parkinson's, right? Some people progress really slowly. Some people progress really fast, right? Is, are they all just the same Parkinson's or is there a different pathophysiological process under there? We want to sort of dissect that out because it tells us something about things. So we see um, a lot of impact in, across, the, across all the sorts of domains, even in manufacturing and scale, in selecting patients, operating trials, right? We have a lot more sensors and wearables now that we can use in trials as well. So even our schedule of clinical assessments is changing. So it is one of those things that it's not just one revolutionary thing that you put in the, the sequence of the person and here's the, here's the molecule you make, right? But it's across all these little changes across the entire big pipeline will speed up the whole thing, right? And I think for me, the biggest impact is something we discovered was if you have targets that have genetic validation and functional validation, they are about twice as likely to become really successful medicines, even if you left the rest of the whole machine unchanged, right? So it shows the impact of putting the right, working on the right things in that pipeline. So there is, there'll be lots of change happening, uh, you know, across the industry, right? Thank you. Um, yeah, there, there are uh, the, the, the criteria that are that have emerged um, in a, in the broader AI ML world of trust, security, fairness um, as being principle you know principles that, uh, uh, that that people evaluate technology against. Um, are there are there adaptations of that framework or or other vectors that uh, that are particularly um, suited to AI and ML as applied to drug to drug discovery? Uh, those are good ones. And, you know, in general, you have to be thinking about those. There are a lot of detailed uh, issues that you, uh, I'll keep this short because I think we have a lot of questions. There are a lot of detailed issues that are a little bit different in biology, maybe. Um, there is um, responsibility because there's liability in, in medical devices and drugs. There, the, the, uh, the, the chain of responsibility for decisions has to be somewhat uh, transparent. Uh, or, or or a bunch of lawyers will make it transparent. So that that's on the mind for the for the AI system. Explainability, which has come up in all areas mm -hmm. of AI, mm -hmm. um, it's it's controversial because there's a difference between the explainability you need when you're convincing people that it works, uh, and that there that might be different from the explainability you need once it becomes. Um, a, 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 a routine part of practice. One thing that I want to stress, and this is really relevant for all AI systems, is we've talked already a lot in the last 53 minutes about the importance of data to inform our AI systems. Once we start deploying AI systems, then the AI systems will be affecting the data that we collect and it's going to be a very complicated situation to, to unravel why we're a new set of biases. So we have all the old biases, and then we're going to have a new set of biases, which are the biases that came from using an AI system in the first place that didn't used to be there. And I'm very, A, concerned, and B, interested in research that starts to untangle how do you update an AI system when part of the data that you're training it with is it, the previous version of that same system. Very complicated. Yeah, there are some lessons from that in the sort of the people who build financial trading algorithms, because once they put it into it, it changes the market, right? And so there are some things to learn from that. But I think um, to the point about sort of um, interoperability, a lot of that is sort of robustness and reliability concerns that people are trying to address, right? Because if you ask people, um, you know, we all interface with algorithms in everyday lives and things like that, or technologies, right? How does an LED work, right? How does this monitor in front of me work? Can I just explain the physics of that? Not all, but it works. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm sure, and, it's, and it has a minimal impact to me, so I don't really need to know. So a lot of the time, what we, where we want that is we want to make sure it's robust and reliable. Like, why does it make it make a decision with inputs? And a lot of times people get care about interoperability a lot more when there's a potential for harm, right? And it all comes back to ensuring that it's a robust system and we know some of the AI systems, right? Particularly some of the visual ones, I flick a few pixels and things like that and I turn a banana into an owl or something like that, right? Well, what happens if I've got uh, my computational pathology algorithm, which is classifying someone's tumor stroma boundaries and other types of properties, it's slightly out of focus, 
right? Or I've got folded tissue. How do I show this robust, reliable, and safe, right? And, you know, certainly the pathologist looking at things, he may have off days. Maybe he doesn't look at all the slide and things like that. There's noise with that, but we can give it to two people, right? And we know there's noise in the system. So there's many different ways to think about that. And I think these are some of the areas that need a lot of research, right? And, and, and are going to be critical to get this because we are sort of taking something into it and we're going to have to run things in parallel with the old system, right? It's not going to be something we're just going to cut out over overnight, right? Because we'll need that observation. But then we also know that like sepsis prediction algorithms that like the ones that I guess are probably made by various EHR manufacturers, right? right. If you look at the look at what's happened now, you look at their performance drifts, their performance decades over time because medicine isn't static. We get better at understanding, recognizing sepsis and things like that so that so the signals train, so maybe that's only the harder patients, right, to detect, right? So there's a lot of things that go into this thing that, as I said, once you put them into practice, and I think that's something that we'll have to consider as well, um, particularly as we gather other data about people, right? Okay. All right, let's try to get one or two more questions in the last three minutes here. Uh, uh, someone asks uh, about penalties for working on ethical problems, uh, uh, about whether there's a biology tax in that if you work on AI and ML for biotech, you got, you're going to get paid less. Um, does that disparity bother you? And how do you, how do you think about addressing that? So, so let me address that because I have some specific experience in this. It, it, it can definitely be the case. Uh, there is a class of machine learning employees who I would call quite mercenary. Uh, and, you know, I've had a startup and we had AI people and I talked to the chief, uh, the, the chief, the CEO, and he was very clear. He said, Russ, this is a tax. We can't pay as much as Facebook and, you know, Google, but it's not that hard to address because our mission is very compelling. So if you're in front of a one of these mercenary people, it is not hard to figure out that they are just going to the highest bidder and you do not hire them. Yep. You find somebody who understands that the mission of curing cancer or making new drugs is a worthwhile mission. And, and, and they can, that, and also, of course, they'll still be able to live and take care of their family. Um, but some of that big bonus that they might get, they're getting it because they're working on the help system for the help system. And okay, God bless you, but maybe you want to work on drugs that are going to cure Alzheimer's. So you have to do that at recruitment time is the advice that I've seen work uh, because you can compete simply on monetary re reimbursement. Uh, but we do have a couple of knobs we can turn because it's a pretty uplifting mission. Okay. And uh, just in the interest of time, yeah. 30 seconds each just on where do you see the principles that we've all been talking about today evolving what, what you know, we talk about the importance of principles evolving uh, here. Uh, uh, just a quick, quick uh, oh, couple sentences each. Go yeah, ahead, Cam. I, I think we're going to look at the time where we sort of rolled out all these recommender systems and stuff in society to be the equivalent of sort of Victorian chimney sweeps and like you know carcinogenic soot and cat compounds. But like, I can't believe they used to do that. So I think that it's going to become just a part of life if we start to think about these sort of things. It's a new technology that's, that's emerging, right? So I, I think it will come back into everything. Russ? I think it's going to be about understanding governance uh, and <laughs> embedding responsibility throughout the organization. The, the ethical theories need to be expanded to think about distributed responsibility. They're not very good at that right now. Um, and they have to be expanded to understand how governance decisions have a direct impact on uh, at the ethical decision making.